Okay. All right, so. On your mark, get set, go. Right? <laughs> now the question is, is, how do I share a screen? I'm new to this. Go to the bottom of this black bar. You just mouse over the bottom of the black bar and a little green box shows up and it says share screen. All right, there we go. Desktop two, share screen. So you should be seeing yep. my presentation here. You got it. Now I just gotta figure out how to make this thing big. Stand by. I just did this a minute ago, what happened? What the heck is here? Come on. I'm gonna make this full screen. I changed my buttons on this thing. So this is a program called Prezi? Yes, it's very cool. And it's better than PowerPoint? Uh, I like it better than PowerPoint. Why? We used Prezi with Olivia, Dawn. You, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty neat. Okay. So, uh, okay, so this is the presentation that I would put together for Renee's wealth class. So you have to bear with me while I work through this. Um, I'm gonna just keep hitting buttons here. Okay, so if you've heard this, I apologize. <clears throat> I'm getting over a head cold too, so if I cough, I apologize for that as well. Um, the, the model that we use to visually help clients understand the overall financial planning uh, system, I call protection, savings, and growth. And picture it as a series of boxes. You've got a set of boxes on the top that's nine boxes, so it's three by, it goes three across, then the next three, then the next three. And you got your next set of boxes, which is the next nine boxes, and then below that, the last set of boxes. What we're going to do is we're going to go through those boxes one at a time and just talk about them. If if you've heard of if you've already heard some of this, uh, you're welcome to just stop me and I'll push forward. So well, we're recording, if you remember, and then we've got our other family members, whoever couldn't be here, who may or may not have heard of it. So okay, perfect. Roll. Perfect. All right. So. Um, one thing that I want to just put out there because the top box is the protection box. And in the top box, we're talking about uh, a lot of insurance and insurance based strategies to protect your uh, assets as well as your wealth, your family and so forth. So the definition of insurance becomes very relevant and I've got that up here on the screen. It's a means of protection from financial loss. It's basically a form of risk management primarily used to hedge against the risk of an uncertainty uh, and, and it's basically anything you're not willing to take that uh, loss into your own pocketbook, okay? Anything that you're not willing to take the loss you want to insure against. So, first thing we do is we talk about auto insurance. And I apologize, my screen is over here, but my, the one I'm looking at is over here, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at my screen. Um, I really can't move this too far. There we go, it's about as far as I can move it. So, auto insurance, we're typically going to cover Property, uh, property coverage, which is damage or theft of a vehicle, liability coverage, the legal responsibility for others uh, in the bodily injury of property damage, medical coverage. Now, auto insurance is not necessarily the best place to have your medical coverage, by the way, but there are some policies that offer a, uh, a, a basic medical plan. <coughs> and then there's some other riders that you can throw in, such as gap insurance. Uh, when, for example, you buy a brand new vehicle, uh, if you were to total it out within a short period of time and you didn't have equity, that's when you're going to have gap insurance pick up. Limits of coverage and deductibles. This is something that I would really hone in based on uh, your ultimate net worth and your financial abilities, okay? Because these things are going to affect your premium. So what you'll find in the industry is, is a lot of agents might say, hey, go ahead and get a $250 deductible. Uh, and you only need the bare minimum coverage, which in Arizona is really low, but let's pretend that's 100, $300,000 $100, for property, $300,000 for liability. The challenge you run into is as your net worth grows, your liability limits should also grow accordingly. Now, I look at that and I say, okay, as your net worth grows and you have more cash available, for example, your emergency reserve fund, which we're going to talk about here momentarily, you probably need to raise your deductible up. Why would you do such a thing? I mean, the idea is that you don't have as much out-of-pocket liability, right? If you raise your deductible from, say, $250 to $1,000, your premium goes down. 
Now you turn around and you buy a $250,000 by um, $500,000 policy, your premium goes back up. What you'll find is, is that your premium is almost the same, but you've got a higher deductible with higher limits. Does that make sense? The idea being, and it goes to that whole idea of insurance, you don't necessarily want to cover items that you could be paying for out of pocket. You also don't want to make claims on the small stuff because that only hurts you. So I use the example, you're in a parking lot, you're backing out of a space, someone else is backing out of a space, you don't see each other, you bump in the middle of the aisle and two taillights fall to the ground. Is that a claim that you make on your insurance? And the answer is no, no, you don't. And it doesn't really matter who's at fault, uh, whether you pay for the other person's car or they pay for yours, pay cash and walk away because that's going to hurt your insurance rates, okay? If you had a $250 deductible, you're likely gonna make that claim, which hurts you. If you have a $1,000 deductible, you're gonna pay cash and you're gonna move on and that's the end of it, you see? So you raise those deductibles up to 1,000, 1,500, even 2,000 as your net worth goes up, and then you wanna have a um, insurance plan, a 250, 500 for example, that is going to cover you in the event of something major and, and catastrophic. That's the, 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 the general gist, and I'm, I'm spending a lot of time auto insurance, but you'll see me in home and, and liability, I'll be able to go much faster because the concept is there, okay? Does that make sense so far? Yeah, I think we're all on board with that, right okay. guys? All right, so moving along, home insurance. Now, you have a very similar story in the home insurance world where this is gonna protect you against things such as fire, theft, water, weather damage. Uh, may include specialized forms of insurance like flood or earthquake, depending on where you live. This is where you're gonna add in certain riders if you have jewelry, guns, artwork, antiques. Um, and again, you're gonna want that higher deductible, okay? And my example always goes to close your garage door because here's what happens. You leave your door open and someone walks by and they walk away with your golf clubs. You're out a bunch of money. Well, the problem is if you make a claim on that for that one item being stolen, your premium goes up. And, and I've, I've actually got a really relevant story that you know, I'll share with you quickly. We used to live in a neighborhood right down the road here, and we had a, a, a neighbor of ours, same similar floor plan as ours. Uh, it's a 5,500 square foot house, and he's there six months out of the year. Six months out of the year, he's gone. Okay, he's, he's a professional ball player. So one year he leaves, and they had a small water claim. And my wife told him, she's in the property casualty business, she says, guys, this is, this is less than $10,000 worth of damage. You need to just suck it up, pay cash, and get this fixed. You should not make this claim, okay? It, it goes on your permanent record for this house. It becomes a real problem. You can afford it, pay the claim. Well, they went and made the claim. Instead of paying for it, they went and made the claim. Now they're on the radar. The next year they went away, their water heater broke. Flooded the entire bottom story of the house, okay? 120, I think the total bill is like $125,000 in damage. That's the claim they should have made, which subsequently they made the claim and immediately they were canceled by their insurance company. The minute that claim was done, they got canceled. Now what they have to do is they have to go find a B-rated company to insure their home because they've got two losses in a year, I think it was a year and a half that they had two losses. Both, one, one shouldn't have even been made. Point is, it goes back to my, my, my conversation of you don't make the small claims because it will hurt you. Going back to my garage door story, right? So you don't make those claims. <coughs> Liability insurance, this is that third box over. Liability insurance is that broad policy that covers all those things that are not covered in your traditional auto and homeowner's policy. It's going to be the, uh, the random event that someone sues you for when they walk onto your property and they trip over uh, a, you know, a crack in the sidewalk and all of a sudden you're liable. So this is where you get that policy in, in force. They're very inexpensive. You can buy a million dollar policy, probably $200 a year, depending on where you live. They're super inexpensive and it's that blanket or umbrella that goes over everything, okay? Going on to the fourth box. This one is the what I call the disability and long-term care box, okay? And the reason there's two items covered in this is because they are kind of one and the same depending on where you're at in life, okay? 
Disability insurance provides financial support in the event you physically become disabled and are unable to work, providing an income. Okay. In you know, short-term disability, you've got two kinds of policies. You've got short-term disability and you've got long-term disability. The short-term disability policy is, you know, it, it might it might start immediately, like day one of sickness, and it will cover you up until uh, your long-term disability policy kicks in. This is a policy you're typically going to find through your employer. It's not going to be a policy you want to buy on an individual basis. On an individual basis, I would suggest you have a good, solid emergency reserve fund, okay? Uh, and that will then carry you over until your long-term disability policy kicks in. Long-term disability insurance is going to pick up, depending on the policy, it's gonna be either 90 days or 180 days. What is that? 90 days or 180 days is your elimination period. That's how long you are financially on your own until your disability insurance kicks in, okay? So again, it goes back to that emergency reserve fund, which I'm gonna hit here in a moment. It's the smarter way to plan for uh, a disability is to have that emergency reserve fund set aside. And if we can get enough saved up that you can have a 180 day waiting period to get your premiums down then that policy in the event of disability would pay a benefit until you become 65 or 70, 67 rather. I just saw the other day a, a company came out with a policy that goes to age 70. Okay, There used to be policies that would actually pay for a lifetime, but insurance companies have since done away with that. They went down to 65 and now they're ratcheting back up to 70. So 70 is the longest benefit you can get today in the, in the disability arena. So these are the considerations, waiting period, benefit period, and various riders. You also need to be aware of exclusions in these policies. Okay, buying a, a long-term disability policy, it's very important that we buy a policy that um, is going to cover all of your various issues and concerns. And what do I mean by that is, um, for example, if you have a specialty specific, we wanna make sure that we cover your specialty. Okay, uh, we want to make sure that it's going to not exclude uh, various occupations or avocations, okay, because some people do things like scuba diving or mountain or rock climbing. So those are things you have to be aware of. And if disability insurance is important to you, we can talk about what that looks like and ultimately design a policy that makes sense. Uh, these are really smart plans to have in the event you become disabled, you, you've got an income. So think about your job too, because I've got clients that say, well, if I become disabled, I mean, I'd have to be nearly dead in order to not do my job, and that might be the case. Um, all right, so let's see here. Long-term care. This is one of those policies or situations, financial situations, where people become concerned that, hey, uh, I'm gonna get old and I've got, either no one to take care of me, or I have someone to take care of me, but there's this situation, they can't financially afford it, and I know I'm using BCTs, and I apologize. <laughs> this is, uh, these are the things that people consider, is hey, I, I, I just don't have the money to pay for me in a long-term care setting. So in the long-term care world, there were a traditional long-term care policy, or there's people that say, I'll just let Medicare and Medicaid take care of me. Uh, in the event something happens, I'll just go into the Medicare Medicaid system. What you need to know about Medicare and Medicaid, they do not cover long-term care. Okay, there are very, very limited settings where they do cover long-term care. What I mean is, as an example, you must be hospitalized for at least three days in a row, and then you have to go to a approved long-term care facility, at which point in time they will cover a grand total of 90 days, at which point in time it no longer covers anything. And in order for it to even cover anything, you must be financially destitute. And I know I'm talking to people that will never want to be financially destitute. You don't want to be in a situation where you will qualify for Medicare or Medicaid. So we push that aside as a non, it's a non-topic because we're, we're never gonna use it anyway. Which means you have to plan for it for yourself, which means it's gonna either have to come from your cash, investments, or you insure against it, going back to the whole concept of let's protect because we don't want to pay for this ourselves. So there's traditional long-term care insurance. These policies have pretty much gone by the wayside. Insurance companies 
have figured out that they they actuarially missed the boat, completely missed the boat. So policies that do still exist, premiums are going up regularly, benefits are being cut tremendously. So this is not your best option for long-term care. At the same time, insurance companies did something pretty smart. They figured out what they figured out in the life insurance arena, because life insurance companies are the companies that issue long-term care insurance. They got smart and they figured out we know life insurance. Actuarially speaking, this is a little creepy. Actuarially speaking, life insurance companies know when you're going to die. Okay. Based on your current age, your current stats, they can actuarially dial it in and they can say, Don, we statistically know you're going to die on this day. It's that they've got it honed down that well. Now, I say it's creepy because they know that information. What they don't know is how. <laughs> Thank goodness. What they, on the, on the long term care side, when I say they missed the boat completely, people are living. Okay. I'm going to say that's creepy. I'm yeah, going to agree that that's pretty creepy. Why yep. am I pixelated? I'm pixelated, Don, aren't I? You are. There's actually I two. I had a very important call last night, Aaron, with Eric Coover, and I was like this last night. I was completely messed up. Anyway, I've got two pictures of you. <laughs> You're you muted, Don. Don, you're muted. The whole time you were laying in bed, you were not pixelated. When you were with Quincy, when you were right, when you were laying in bed, you weren't pixelated. Huh? It just started. I I was, I, it, it, well, it just started. So weird. All right, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt, but that's great. When's Aaron gonna die, Lane? <laughs> <laughs> I do not know the answer to that because they will not release that data. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> so anyway, going back to the long-term care discussion, what where they miss the boat is, is people are living longer, okay? And, and you think about a long-term care setting, as, as unfortunate as they are, you've got people that are living in these nursing homes and their bodies are, are slowly failing, but they have the medicine to keep them alive where their minds are going. So they live longer and longer in these nursing home type settings. So the insurance companies, financially, frankly, were taking it in the shorts. Hence the reason that they've cut benefits, they've raised premiums, they've done away with policies. Major insurance companies that played in the long-term care arena, like Genworth, they're out completely. They've stopped selling, they've just done away with their entire their long-term care model. So how do we fix this problem? The insurance companies actually did something quite, frankly, brilliant. And what they did was, is they put what's called a long-term care rider on your life insurance, okay, which was just brilliant. I don't know why it took them so long to figure this one out. So as an example, let's pretend you have a $500,000 life insurance policy, okay? You now have a $500,000 pot of money to use towards long-term care. The rules are virtually the same. So for example, you need to be unable to perform two of the activities of daily living which I have listed on the screen here as dressing, bathing, eating, toileting, maintaining continence, and transferring, okay? Now what's important to know is when I say uh, eating, for example, that doesn't mean your ability to prepare food. That means your ability to get it from a fork on a plate into your mouth. That's eating, not preparing the food. Um, but if you look at these, if you're unable to dress yourself, it's probably safe to say that you're not able to transfer from a bed to a chair, okay? Or toilet, meaning get on and off of a toilet by yourself. If you can't do two of those activities of daily living, you now qualify for the long-term care rider, which now makes that big pot of money in your life insurance policy available to you, okay? So we're gonna talk about life insurance more in just a moment. I just wanna bring up the long-term care rider, and companies all have different names for these things, one company will call it a long-term care writer. Another company will call it something different. They all work very similarly in the end. But that's, that's important to know what long-term care is and where it fits into your plan because we're not getting any younger. It's ultimately going to become an issue that we need to address. Social, I'm sorry, health, uh, next box over is health insurance. Now, I won't spend a tremendous amount of time on health insurance. You have a question? Yeah, so the rider, what you're saying is if you have a $500,000 life insurance policy and you end up that you need long-term care, 
that instead of paying out the, would it reduce your policy by the amount that they paid out? Yes, great question. So you have a $500,000 policy, you go into a long-term care setting, you now have a bucket of $500,000 to use towards long-term care. Pretend you use 250,000 towards long-term care and then you die. 250,000 is remaining, that will be paid to your beneficiaries. Gotcha, okay. As a life insurance benefit. All right, thank you. Okay, health insurance. I'm not going to spend a tremendous amount of time on this one, um, and there's a lot of reasons. I used to I used to do a lot of health insurance business. Frankly, when Obama and the government got into the private health insurance market, I got out uh, simply because they came in and just threw a cherry bomb right in the middle of the whole thing. Um, you've got individual policies, you've got business policies or group insurance. Um, what can I say? You're also in different states. If, if you're self-employed, you can look into your state employment uh, or your state uh, to see if they, if they have a group policy for your uh, company. If you're self-employed, so for example, I'm self-employed here in Arizona. I have a Blue Cross Blue Shield policy and it's through my company, so it's, a, it's considered group insurance. My company pays the premium, subsequently deducts the premium as a business expense. If it's an individual policy, you cannot do that. Okay, but I think, you know, Don, you're self-employed. Aaron, I think you're self-employed too, are you not? I have a company. Okay, perfect. So do that. Now, here's one thing that I will share with you that I'm doing here in Arizona. I don't know if it will work in your state, but you should certainly look into it. It is the, in Arizona, it's called the Arizona Health Insurance Tax Credit. Okay, and long and short of it was, you apply through the state, in my world it was the state, and if you qualify, they give you this credit. And it's actually a premium credit. So for example, my bill for my, my company was $2,800. I got a $1,400 per month credit. Okay, so I got my, pardon me, Zimmer! Sorry, I'm working from home. <laughs> so my dog decides that FedEx guy is gonna Pardon me one second. Zipper! Knock it off! Juan, do you know how long this call is going to be? Um, I, can, I can speed it up if you need me to. No, I'm just curious. I, I have to leave it. I have to leave here at 11.45. Which oh, I'm we'll be done by then. Okay. We'll be done well before that. No question. Okay. That's, uh, let's see, it's, oh, you're at 11.30 now, aren't you? No, I'm at, I'm at 10.30. Oh, okay, good. I'm at 10.30 as well. You're, you're local in my area. Anyway, this premium tax credit is um, tremendously valuable. I mean, it literally cut my premium 50%. So you might want to check into that in your state and see how that applies to you, okay? Um, moving right along. Social security, another area I'm not going to spend a tremendous amount of time on. We're all young. I don't believe social security is necessarily going to be there when I hit 65 or 67. We're going to all be at the 67 bracket when we technically retire according to Social Security. By the time we get there, that probably raise it to 70 if it still exists. The way I look at Social Security is if you're paying into it, what you need to do is you need to walk through your benefits, get a current statement from the Social Security departments, make sure that it is accurate, meaning that they are accounting for the dollars that you're sending in, okay? Because they can only go back and correct it so far back, okay? So just make sure it's accurate, and the reality is, is the planning that we do in, in the world that I work in, I don't count on Social Security. If you happen to get it, it's extra icing on that cake, okay? So I don't spend a lot of time on it other than to say, go check it and make sure that it's being reported accurately compared to your tax returns, and if the numbers are right, move on. I don't spend a lot of time on Social Security because of that. It's a system we have no control over. And, and there's benefits if you die, it's a whopping $255. So <laughs> it's hardly worth even talking about. Okay, wills, trusts, and supporting documents. This is where we get into estate planning. Not everybody needs a trust, okay? Everybody should have at least a will, a healthcare power of attorney, a durable power of attorney, a last will and testament, a living will. These are all documents that everybody should have. A trust, if your net worth, and really it comes down to what type of assets you have as well, 
if your net worth is breaching, say, five hundred to seven hundred fifty thousand into the million dollar range, you really need to look at having at least a revocable living trust. Okay, depending on where your net worth is, you might start going into that arena of irrevocable trusts as well. These documents allow for the effective transfer of your wealth at your passing. It avoids probate. Uh, it allows for secrecy and privacy. Not that you're trying to be secret, but more private. You want to make sure that uh, your your wishes are executed with, with you know, post haste. You don't, you don't want uh, people challenging what you say you want to have happen. So that's where these things happen. Okay. Now, what's important about a trust, for example, is you're going to name who gets what, when they get it, maybe under the circumstances that they get it, and in that document it's important that you also do something called funding the trust, okay? And this is what I, I just want to throw out there, a, a, maybe a little warning. You can get a trust done for, depending on where you go, as little as a thousand bucks. You can also spend significant money, almost an unlimited amount of money for the complexities. As you add more complexities, the more expensive it gets. The higher end law firms are going to charge more because they have more marble and tile to pay for, okay? You don't need to spend ten thousand dollars on a trust unless it's tremendously complicated. I would tell you the average is going to be two to three thousand dollars, and with that, you're going to get your all of the documents you see on the screen: the trust, um, last will and testament, healthcare power, durable power, living will, all of that. Okay, the living will, by the way, is your end of life decisions. What do you want to have done in the event of, for example, pull the plug or stay on life support? Which one is it? Uh, durable power of attorney over health care, durable power of attorney over financial affairs. So you need to put some thought into who do you trust, okay? And, and I can assure you, as sad as it is, I have, seen, I have seen families absolutely completely melt down and fall apart over these issues, okay? So think it through very carefully and use the right attorney and get it done. But now going back to that whole funding, what is that? It sounds big, it's not big. But when you're talking with the attorney, you want to ask this question. Will you assist in funding my trust? And if so, what is the additional cost? Okay, why that's relevant, and I'll give you an example. Funding means changing title of assets that hold title into your trust. Bank accounts, automobiles, your properties, all hold title. And all of those things need to be changed from your personal name into your trust name, okay? That's called funding your trust, okay? There'll be one, one single piece of paper that you would sign that takes anything that does not hold title, okay? So for example, you've got grandma's china collection that she left to you that's sitting there in that beautiful china hutch that you wanna to leave to your child. There's no title to that, okay? So there would be a schedule and a, and a document in the trust that states, that China is now owned by the trust, and then you'll put on the schedule that that China is to go to your child, okay? So it's really that simple, okay? Um, if, if, if you need an attorney, can't find an attorney, let me know and I'll do my best to find someone in your area that, that might be suitable, okay? We do have a network of attorneys that we can refer within and people know people, I know people that know people, so I'll have my people look them up for you. This is the, this is really, I should have pressed the button. This is the ownership and beneficiary designations that goes along with that whole funding conversation. Who gets what, when they get it, under what circumstances. Uh, life insurance, beneficiary becomes the trust. Again, it goes back to the funding. It's all part of the funding process. Okay, the last box in the protection component is life insurance. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about this one. I'm gonna press through the other boxes, then we're gonna come back and talk about this one because this one becomes very important. In life insurance, it's a contract between the policyholder, uh, the insurer, where the insurer is promising to make a, a designated beneficiary payment, a, a sum of money. A, 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 a beneficiary is gonna receive a large sum of money at the death of the insured. That's really all there is to it. Depending on the contract, so that you can offer uh, other benefits such as terminal illness or critical illness, also known as long-term care uh, riders, where we can then 
have a policy do various, um, we can design the policy to do different things for you. Let's see here. This is some of the legal stuff where I just like to talk a little bit about the legal side. I think you guys understand what life insurance is. You got to make sure what's excluded. Okay. There are certain exclusions in life insurance. Okay. There's always a suicide clause. Two years with every company is always the same. Two years. You cannot buy a life insurance policy and then within two years commit suicide. After the two years, that no longer exists. Okay. I'm not suggesting you buy it and wait two years. I'm suggesting that that's the uh, that's the deal. They also will throw in exclusions for various avocations and um, you know various hobbies and such. So if you're a an avid underwater diver, they may put an exclusion on you if you were to die in an underwater diving accident. Okay, if you uh, fly a plane and you don't have the hours, uh, they might put a premium, an extra premium on you, or they may exclude you if you were to die while piloting a plane, not on a commercial aircraft. Okay, traveling from point A to point B. But if you were in the cockpit flying that plane and died, they may not cover you. So we disclose all of this up front, and that way it's not a concern. Okay? If it's disclosed on the application and they do not exclude it, specifically exclude it, then it is covered. And it does not matter how you were to pass away. Make sense? Life insurance contracts tend to fall into two major categories. Okay, Now, I, I share this with you because it goes back to what I was sharing with you about the long-term care writer. You have your protection policies, which are designed really just to provide a benefit, typically a lump sum payment in the event of death. We might use it specifically for the long-term care benefit and then pay out whatever's left. And then you've got your investment type, uh, investment type policies where we're, we're designing an investment strategy, a long-term strategy out of this. These are typically going to be policies where you can do a single premium or larger premiums. And I'm going to share with you an illustration of why that looks, what, what that looks like and how that works. Common forms are your, are your permanent insurance. And I'm going to give you a quick 101 on, on life insurance so you can be on the same page. Let me press the buttons here. Okay. Quick 101 on life insurance. There are two major types of life insurance. You have term insurance and you have permanent insurance. Okay. Term insurance is, the term is how long the premium is level for. Okay. So for example, you can get what's called an annual renewable term where every year the premium goes up just a little bit, but you get a very large death benefit for a very small premium. You have a 10-year term, a 15-year term, a 20-year term. You can actually go up to a 30-year term, meaning that the premium is level for that 10, 15, 20, or 30-year period, and the benefit is fixed. These are typically policies that are best used in settings where you have a need for life insurance for a specific amount of time, okay? Another sitting might be where you have a need for a lot of life insurance for a specific amount of time and you do not want to spend a lot of premium, okay? So for example, hey, I know I want a million dollar policy until my child turns 20 years old. My child is currently two. I'm going to get a 20 year term policy for a million dollars, okay? If I die, I know that there will be a million dollars to take care of my child just like that. Okay, that's an example. It might be a business setting. It might be any other setting. That's term insurance. Low premium, high death benefit. No cash value buildup. It's like renting insurance. At the end of the term, you don't get your money back. That's term insurance. Okay? On the other side, you have permanent insurance. Permanent insurance is where you're going to get into cash value buildup. It's where you're going to get into tax benefits, income tax-free uh, income streams. That is going to be uh, where you're going to get into whole life, universal life, index life, and variable life. Okay, I'm not a big fan of variable life, and I'll, I'll just tell you why. Variable life insurance, you pay in a premium. Well, you know what? Let me back up. I'm going to start with whole life because that's the oldest version of insurance, and it'll set the foundation for the rest. Whole life has been around forever. It's the oldest life insurance that's known to man. It's a fixed premium. If we use a company that pays a dividend, like what I would use is a Mass Mutual or a New York Life, one of these companies that pays a dividend. Dividends are not guaranteed. Cash value growth has a guaranteed element to it, and the death benefit has a guaranteed element to it. Okay, It's a very straightforward policy. It is not very sexy at all, um, but there's guarantees as to what the outcomes are going to be in the future. From whole life came universal life. You pay your premium in, 
out comes the cost of insurance and taxes and all of that. And then whatever is left is then invested by the insurance company into a very conservative investment pool. Okay, and they're doing things like money markets and cash and CDs and, and various things that um, really aren't very, again, very sexy. They're earning 4% interest. So your cash value grows based on how they invest that money versus the other policy, which was a dividend. Okay. The death benefit is typically level and you have some cash value building. Again, not a very sexy policy. Then they, they created variable life. Variable life, you pay in your premium, out comes the cost of insurance and mortality and expense fees and taxes, and whatever is left is then directed by you as an investor into what we call sub-accounts. In my world, we have to call them sub-accounts. They look like, act like, and smell like mutual funds. We have to call them sub-accounts. However those sub-accounts perform dictates your cash value growth or decline. There is no guarantee on what it will do. So if we have another 2008, your cash value in that policy can go down significantly. You can lose your cash value. There's no guarantees on it, which subsequently can put your death benefit in jeopardy. So I'm not a fan of the uh, variable life model simply because of there's no guarantees. And also because the insurance companies subsequently came out with, this has been about 20 years now, they came out with a policy called indexed life insurance. I'm a big fan of index life insurance because it works very simply like this. You put your premium in, out comes those various costs. The rest is then put into um, an index account. And I'm gonna use the S&P 500 because I think we all know what the S&P 500 is. The money goes into the S&P 500. However, there is a guarantee. The guarantee is a 0% floor. So if the market goes below, if the S&P drops below 0%, you stop at 0%. On the upside, there might be a cap. Let's say it's 13%, okay? So your cash value each year, it's guaranteed to earn between zero and 13%. I can look you in the eye and tell you, your cash value will earn between zero and 13%. It's contractually guaranteed, written right into the contract, okay? And I like that, that's a good program. The nice part about it is, is each year, your cash value locks in on your policy anniversary date. So let's pretend you got 7% return from this policy year to this policy year. This becomes your new cash value, your new point A. You guys are familiar with point A, point B. This was your point A before, this becomes your point B. At the end of your year, this becomes your new point A, and we start from there. We never go below this again. Okay, does that make sense? Yep. Okay, that's index life in a nutshell. The advantages that you gain, and this goes to all permanent insurance, is the tax benefits. All of that cash value growing grows tax deferred. So you're not gonna pay any tax on the growth during the growth accumulation phase. Then you've got the payout phase. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk you through an illustration in a minute. On the payout phase, all of the income that you receive from that policy is income tax free. And I'll explain the mechanics of that when I show you the illustration. You know what a Roth IRA is, right? You put money in, you cannot deduct it on your tax returns. However, it grows tax deferred. You don't pay any tax on the growth. And when you pull it out, it's all tax free. That's a Roth IRA. This is a Roth IRA on steroids. Okay, because the difference is in a Roth IRA, there's all kinds of limitations. How much you can put in, um, whether you can use it or not based on your income level, etc. You know, all these IRS rules that follow it. There's very few IRS rules that surround life insurance. Very few. But there's all sorts of benefits. Okay, so we're gonna go into that. All right, so we finished with the, the first set of boxes. Now I'm gonna drop down from the protection component to the savings and the growth. I'm gonna move through these pretty quickly simply because they're just, they're conversation. You have cash. Cash is going to be various ways that you set aside money, okay? Maybe it's under your mattress or in a safe, it's cash. Um, the, the first six boxes in this arena all are used for your emergency reserve fund. Everyone should have an emergency reserve fund, as evidenced by 2008, okay? People in my industry got very confident and comfortable that the emergency reserve fund did not need to be as big as it needed to be, okay? I heard advisors saying one month is fine, two months is fine, if anything, because they had it all invested, right? Just before 2008, we were making so much money, it was ridiculous. Now, people are saying, you should have at least six months, 
Okay. Now what I would say is you need to have what you're comfortable with in an emergency reserve fund and it can be in cash, savings, money markets, savings bonds, certificates of deposit, credit union accounts. These are the top six boxes. Here's what I'm going to tell you. And I don't, I don't make a dime on this, by the way. I just want to share it because I think it's brilliant. I used to bank at the local credit union. I hate the big banks. Every one of them, they're just, I, I've never had a good experience with the big banks. Wells, Bank of America, Chase, name it, they all are horrible. I was with the credit union for 30 years and I was being nickeled and dimed to death. So I started doing some research. You guys are all very comfortable on the internet, so you probably understand going to uh, an internet bank like ally.com. I love Ally Bank. It's A L L Y.com. You want to look them up. Okay. Free checking, free savings. It's an internet bank. I've used them for several years now and I absolutely love Ally Bank. The other one is Capital 360. The reason I'm pushing you more towards Ally is their interest rates are higher. Create yourself a checking account, create yourself a savings account. Yes, you can put them into a trust. The savings account, don't, don't hold me to this. I want to say the last time I looked, the savings account was paying 1.45% interest rate. That is not sexy. However, compare that to your Wells Fargo, your Chase, where they're paying 0.01% interest. Okay, So if you have any money at all, you're, you're making money. right? And that's where you keep your emergency reserve. Completely free, completely liquid. And if you must keep your... Um, your uh, brick and mortar bank link the two online so that you can just transfer money back and forth and keep all your major savings over at ally okay that's just a little helpful advice okay tax deferred this box and, and you notice i don't write anything in here because i just i like to have conversation about it i am no longer in the investment arena i've surrendered my securities licenses um, however i spent 20 years in the investment arena so i know it quite well Tax deferred, this is where you're going to find your 401ks, your uh, annuities, your IRAs, all are gonna fall into the tax deferred box. What you need to know about these things, they cost money to set up, they cost money to maintain, 401ks, especially when you're self-employed, et cetera, all cost money to maintain. And there's this rather large book that the IRS has published, when I say rather large, I'm not kidding, of rules that you must follow rules on the contribution side, on the matching of employees if you have employees, uh, penalties if you don't follow the rules, and then worst of all, rules that you must follow when you distribute money. Okay, so for example, you're putting money into a 401k or an IRA, and that money becomes non-accessible until you turn 59 and a half. If you touch the money prior to 59 and a half, you pay ordinary income tax at whatever tax bracket you're in, plus a 10% penalty tax. Okay, once you hit 59 and a half, you lose the 10% penalty tax. However, everything comes out as ordinary income. So there's all these rules that you have to follow. And then when you hit 70 and a half, you're required by law to take the money out. Well, what if you don't need the money? <laughs> now you're forced to take money you don't want because the IRS wants their taxes. So I'm not a huge fan of the qualified retirement plan because of all of the rules. Um, tax free. This is where you're going to get into your Roth IRA, uh, your tax-free type investments. Roth IRAs are probably the, the best example in this arena. A Roth IRA allows for a non-deductible contribution. It grows tax-deferred, and when you take it out, it's tax-free. That's the basics of it. You still have the 59 and a half rule, and you still have the 70 and a half rule, okay? So there's still some rules that you have to follow. However, they're a little more liberal, and the tax benefits are a little better, okay? So if you're going to fund anything, fund a Roth IRA. However, you do have limitations on funding based on your income level. Okay, And those numbers are a moving target, by the way. Okay, So if you want a Roth IRA, find competent investment advisor and work with that person to create the Roth IRA platform. And I have people in my office, by the way, that do all of that. I just, I don't do it personally anymore for that reason. So... Tax deferred and tax deductible, the other, not this box, but the one before that, these two kind of go hand in hand because I could easily put your 401k and your IRA here because there becomes deductibility that you can have. Um, those two boxes tend to be very similar in the, in the 
tools that we use. Um, there are other tax deductible items that you can utilize in the investment arena, SEP IRAs and so forth when you become self-employed. Those are all things that you want to find an investment advisor that understands those things. And again, I can refer you to people that I trust, uh, the people that bought my book of business because they're still my clients and I still see them and talk to them. So I wanted to make sure I can trust them. So, and they're licensed in other states so they can work with you through technology and so forth. Uh, I, again, I just don't play with that stuff anymore. The types of, okay, so now we've gone through protection, we've gone through savings, because those are your savings components. Now we're gonna go into the last one, which is growth. Growth has nine boxes. The, the top set of boxes, the first three are mostly conservative. Government bonds, super boring, not very sexy. Uh, you're buying government debt. Uh, you're not paying great interest rates. The, the, the key is that it's, it's backed by the government, so the odds are you're gonna get paid. It's, it's one of many investment strategies. Next is corporate bonds, okay? Corporate bonds is going to be where a corporation issues a bond, uh, similar to the government, the difference is it's with a specific corporation or set of corporations because you can buy mutual fund bonds. Um, it's, it's a little bit higher risk than the government, but not, uh, it's not on a scale of one to 10, it's a three. So kind of boring, uh, but you can make some good interest there. Municipal bonds. Now you're dealing with a municipality, such as uh, a state or a local government, a county. Um, these again are gonna be government backed, kind of boring, but they're backed by the taxpayer. So you've got some advantage there. These are also going to be partially tax free, okay, depending on the bond you buy. So for example, if you were to buy, like I live in Maricopa County, Arizona. If I were to buy a municipal bond in Maricopa County, I might not pay any county tax or state tax, but I will pay a federal tax. Okay. If I buy a, a federal municipal bond, I will not pay any federal tax, but I might pay a state tax depending on the state I live in. So you just need to know that. And again, competent tax, or I'm sorry, competent uh, investment advisor would know which one you would pay tax on based on your state. This is the kind of stuff, by the way, where as you start to get more conservative and more diversified as you get older and closer to retirement, less risky, this is where you're going to start looking is in the municipal bond arena. It's a very good diversification tool. And you get into your preferred stocks. Okay, now you're talking about blue chip stocks and let's see the next one is blue chip stocks. Preferred stocks and blue chip stocks, these are your average stocks where you go to the stock market and you buy 100 shares of you know, Intel or Google or whatever stock you want. That's gonna be your preferred and your blue chips depending on what um, uh, indice they're on. For example, the Dow, the NASDAQ, the S&P, the Hang Seng, there's so many of them out there now. But you can buy individual stocks. Again, very, very important that you find a competent investment advisor, ideally someone that does not day trade or trade actively on that account. Okay, quick story. I sent a client who wanted to take more risk. I sent him over to a, an investment advisor that I had met. He did stocks, and he was basically day trading on this guy's account in Apple. He, he lost the guy $50,000. He came back to me mad and I said, hey, you wanted to take more risk. You want to buy individual stocks. He told you what you wanted to, he told you what you wanted to do and you did it and now you're not happy with the results. So don't buy into somebody that's gonna day trade. Buy into someone that's going to maybe buy and hold on stocks. Buy quality and hold them for a while. It doesn't mean you want to you know, hold forever. However, you don't want to be that in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, because now you're just racking up commissions, okay? See here, growth securities. These are your mutual funds. These are going to be your your general mutual funds where you're buying a diversified portfolio in and of itself. Okay, because all a mutual fund is is a conglomeration of stocks and bonds all lumped together by one advisor or team of advisors that have looked at it and said our goal is X. That goal might be income, it might be growth, it might be speculative, it could be any number of things. Okay, there's funds out there called green funds energy resources for example you buy healthcare mutual funds this is a very good way to diversify your portfolio and I would suggest mutual funds before I would invest in individual stocks especially if you're just starting to dip your toe in the investment arena okay it allows you to be diversified with a smaller amount of money all right we're almost done with these boxes and I'm going to go back up to the top collectibles art coins baseball cards these are things that 
you might think are um, they're, they're, they're investment opportunities or you might think, hey, this is something I really like. I really enjoy this. I want to have this nice artwork, okay? If you do these things, and if, especially if they're of any real value, going back to your homeowner's policy, get a writer to cover it, okay? You don't want to buy some really nice artwork and it's not covered under your homeowner's policy and if your house were to burn down, you've lost your artwork and it wasn't covered, okay? So just keep that in mind. I don't spend a tremendous amount of time on that, um, mostly because people don't tend to have huge collections of stuff in a lot of cases. If you have a giant gun collection, you probably ought to have it insured, okay, um, and locked. Real estate. Real estate involves your primary residence. It involves rental property. It involves commercial property. Any kind of real estate, even raw land. Okay, oil and gas leases. This is where you can get into investment into real estate where you're buying oil and gas leases. And again, a competent investment advisor might suggest that you buy what's called a REIT, R-E-I-T, Real Estate Investment Trust. These are not typically very liquid any more than typical real estate, but you need to know about REITs because they tend to perform well in good real estate markets like right now. When you're buying individual real estate, please, please, please seek competent counsel. And here's an example of what I'm talking about. You have your primary residence and you have this house down the street that you own and you lease it out. It's a rental, right? Let's pretend that that rental has a pool and let's, let's see that as the only thing that's in there. You have a pool in this rental house. You probably should have a separate company, an LLC at least, that owns that rental property and nothing else, okay? The tenant makes the payment to the LLC, you have a clean business entity there. Because let's pretend for a moment that something tragic happens at that rental property, okay? And you need to have proper insurance on that house as well, obviously. Something tragic happens, okay? You get sued, the tenant sues you. Let's pretend they win. What are they gonna get? In a best case scenario, they're gonna get the house that was owned in that LLC, okay? That's, that's, the, that's generally the, what's going to happen. They can't come after you personally because you've separated the two entities. You see what I just did there was I created a separate entity in and of itself that contained that property. So you need to get any rental properties that you have into that separate LLC. I own a commercial building in a separate LLC. If anything ever happened there and they tried to sue me personally, which they likely would try, the attorneys and the judge would probably push everything personal out because I have a legitimate business entity set up. The only thing it owns is that business, that building rather, okay? So it's just a layer of protection. It kind of goes hand in hand with the whole trust planning and so forth, okay? Last but not least is tax shelters. This one is generally reserved for your higher net worth and your higher income levels because now we get into the fun stuff. This is where we get into things like wealth captives insurance companies where you can actually create your own insurance company and set significant amount of money aside tax-free it grows tax deferred and you can open up a whole new world of investment opportunities you're not going to cross into this threshold until your income typically hits the I would tell you if your income is sitting about a million a year you're going to want to start looking at these types of opportunities okay and if you're there Please don't be offended by me saying we're not there to talk about it. This is a whole other conversation, and I want you to reach out to me individually, and we'll talk about it because it's something that I can go down a rabbit hole for two hours on. Okay, there's some real neat opportunities there. All right, so that is the end of that part of the presentation. So now, bear with me while my computer struggles. I'm going to show you, going back to life insurance for just a moment, I'm going to show you something kind of neat. Okay, I created here, going back to that whole life insurance conversation, I'm a huge fan of using life insurance that is properly designed as a long-term strategy, a long-term tool to create tax-free income. Will it create significant wealth if I were to pass away? Yeah, it will. Okay, but I've also got goals. I've got four kids, I've got a wife, and I've got things that need to be paid for. So if I die, I need to have those things taken care of. On the other hand, I'm not planning on dying. I'm planning on living. 
and I'm planning on retiring and having as much income as I can create, and my goal would be to have it as tax-free as humanly possible. Okay? So I'm a fan of using a, a strategy that will create that for me. Having spent 20 years in the investment arena, I'm also not a fan of playing around in the markets. I've done that, been there, done that. I've watched people lose money. I've made people a lot of money. It's very stressful. And what I've learned is in the investment side of the arena, and one of the biggest reasons I got out, we have no control over what happens in the markets. We may think we have control. I guarantee you we have no control of what happens in the markets. Anything that we do as the common individual is completely and totally reactionary to what is actually happening on Wall Street. Okay. And, and, and I'll share another quick thing with you because this is, this is true. In New York, there are companies that pay millions of dollars to get just a little bit closer to the exchanges. When I mean a little bit closer, I'm talking about if they can get one apartment space closer for their servers to sit so their cable is that much shorter than the competitor so their computer can make decisions that much faster than the competitor, it's worth millions and millions and millions of dollars, okay? And if those people are paying to have their computers that much closer so that their cable is just a little bit shorter, we couldn't possibly compete with that in the, in the retail space. So we, as a human population, we are all reactionary to what is happening with, with, on Wall Street, okay? So I became very skeptical of, okay, are we really doing our clients a service by being invested in the markets? Okay. I know that sounds a little conspiracy theory and all of that. However, it is true. I have looked into it. These machines and these, these things do exist. So where I, where I go with this is I say, all right, how can we benefit from this and take the risk out and still benefit from the market going up and still get all the tax advantages and still get all the other benefits that we're talking about? And the reality of it is life insurance is a perfect tool. The challenge that we face is it has a bad rep. What I mean by that is it's been abused. There are people out there that do it wrong by either designing it incorrectly or giving bad advice. So I, I, I approach it from the, I'm going to tell you everything you want to know and stuff you don't want to know. However, by the time we're done, you'll be able to look at it and say, I either understand it and it makes sense or I don't understand it. You need to help me understand more. Okay? So I'm not here to sell you anything. If you like the concept, I'll help you get into it. If you don't like the concept, I won't help you get into it. I'm fine with it. Here's what you need to know. This is going back to indexed life insurance. Okay, because remember, I've vetted whole life, variable life, universal life, and each one has a place. Okay. What you see on your screen is an example of an indexed life insurance policy. Okay. And I've created this based on a female, 55 years old, preferred non-tobacco, okay, because underwriting does matter. Um, I put in a premium annually of $25,000 a year. You know, when I say premium, I have to call it a premium because it is going into a life insurance policy. Picture it as a contribution to your retirement account of $25,000 a year. Okay, because it's the same thing. Contribution to retirement or premium, six one way, half a dozen the other. And, and you'll see I'm pointing to it right here on the screen. It's this $25,000 right here. So over 10 years, it's $250,000. And we fund, we fund it to age 67, so it's a little more. It's 275, uh, 300,000, okay, total going in. And I'm gonna explain what these columns mean. But first, right up here at the top, I'm using what's called a one-year point-to-point, okay? Now this is a fun conversation, I love this conversation. One-year point-to-point, okay? Everybody knows what the S&P 500 is, right? And we all look at it from January 1st, to December 31st. That's a one year period. Point A is January 1st, point B is December 31st. In the case of your policy, unless you bought it on January 1st, your one year point to point is not January 1st to December 31st. Okay? Your one year point to point is your policy anniversary date to one year later. So if you were to buy your policy, what's today? March 8th. Your anniversary date is March 8th to March 8th, okay? So I have this conversation with a client who I'll leave nameless. He, uh, he calls me up every year, December 31st. Lane, what's the, how did my account do? And I said, I need you to call me back in August. That is your policy anniversary date. 
August 15th. Call me on the 16th. Oh, that's right, I remember. So he calls me on August 16th and I tell him his updated numbers because it's one year point to point. Remember, it's an indexed account. We have a 0% floor, and in his case, we had a 12% cap, okay? And I think his has jumped up to 13, but the point is zero floor, 13 cap, and every year it locks in. If the S&P goes negative, he stops here. He does not go below that. He just does not make any money that year. So in a 2008 scenario, you didn't lose any money. However, you didn't make any money. Which one's better, right? 2008, people lost 40, 50% return. In my accounts, I didn't lose anything. I didn't make anything, but I didn't lose anything. That's what happens in a 2008 in this scenario. So in the one year point to point, you'll see this number that I'm kind of circling right here. It says 7.54%, okay? So all of the projections that I'm showing you here are based on 7.54%. Now I've had clients say to me, especially right after 2008, when we were looking at these policies, 2009, 2010, clients were saying 7.54 is ridiculous. That's just, that's absurd. You can't make 7.54%. And I say, here's the thing. And I, I actually have sheets that I can pull out and show. So if you look at the history of the S&P 500 going back over 40 years, 40 years, the return to the average investor has actually been about 2%, okay? So yes, Mr. Client, you are correct. 7.54 is actually pretty high if I'm looking at the S&P 500. However, all of these negatives that you see, if I stop all of those negatives at 0% and I recalculate, factoring all of those to just 0%, the actual return was 7.54. Oh, I get it. So when I'm showing you a 7.54 on average, it is an actual average return of the S&P going back at least 40 years because all of the negatives stop at zero, okay? So come over here to this non-guaranteed assumed column and you see account value right here and you see your net cash value and I'll explain the difference between the two. Then you see your death benefit. So account value. This is what, uh, what your account is actually worth, okay? What it's growing to by your contribution plus any growth. Okay, now you, you'll see it's lower than what you've put in. And remember, this is an insurance policy and there are costs of insurance and administrative fees that have to come out, okay? So that's why in the first year you put in 25 and it's worth 20 as an example. You see your net cash value. All, all life insurance policies, okay, without exception, all policies have what's called a surrender charge. The surrender charge is there to protect the insurance company from you buying a policy and then cashing out before they've even recouped any of their costs for underwriting commissions and all of the fees that it costs them to underwrite this policy. So if you were to get into this in policy year one and then you changed your mind, you'd get back in this example $5,000, $5,400. Bad idea. Okay, if you were going to get in and get out like that, I would tell you don't even do it. A waste of money, okay? What you also need to know is that surrender charge, as you go further down, that surrender charge goes away. Okay, and you'll see out here, uh, oh, where's it at? These surrender charges tend to last a while, so they actually go away at some point in time. These two numbers are the same. These two columns are getting closer and closer, and you'll see, you know, we're gonna start withdrawals, so they may never look the same. They're usually about, 10 to 15 years and the surrender charge goes away. This is a long-term strategy. If you're getting into this for the long term, you do not need to worry about the surrender charge. If you're getting into it for a short-term product, don't do it, or you need to worry about the surrender charge, okay? So I'm looking at this account value because what I would like you to see here is at eight, if this person's 55 years old, at the age of 67, which is year 12, you got my, my cursor over it, their account value is $396,000. And now what I did here was I said, okay, computer, I want you to stop taking premium. I wanna let this money just sit and grow, let it season for a year or two, and let's turn on income at age 71, okay, which is when Social Security would hypothetically pick up at the end of age 70. So you're, you just turned 71, and I turn on income, and you'll see it illustrated as, an, as a negative number. It's actually 52,000. $100 per year. So I turn on income for a period of 20 years from 70 to age 90 of $52,000 a year tax-free 
okay? Which means I put in $300,000, I'm looking down here at the very bottom, I put in 300,000, I pulled out 741,000 tax-free, and I'm gonna go over here, if I were to die at age 90, there's still a $412,000 death benefit payable to my heirs. So this policy has created tremendous wealth with zero risk in the market, all tax deferred growth, and when I pulled it out at a later date, was all tax free. It's almost hard to believe that this exists, right? But this policy here did not have a long-term care writer on it. I could throw that on there, but this policy was not designed for that. Okay, this policy was designed for growth. So here's what agents won't tell you, okay? And you need to know this, because if you want to do this policy with another agent, I'm fine with that. I will be happy to take a look at what they're proposing so that it's, it's designed correctly. Because design is 100% of why these plans either succeed or fail, okay? This is a good design, okay? And what I mean by good is you'll notice at the top, where's that? You'll notice right here, I have a death benefit of $500,000, okay? A premium of $25,000. When I'm designing a policy with the intention being growth, I can go into the computer and I can say, okay, computer, I want to put in $25,000 a year for this amount of time. What is the minimum death benefit that I have to buy in order to maintain all of those great tax advantages? Okay. The computer actually came back and told me that number was $487,215, something like that. Okay. You'll notice that this does not say 487,215. It says 500. I rounded it off. And I'm trying to illustrate a point here. I could actually now get in $25,250, whatever the number is. Where an agent will go wrong, and where, where I, this is the part that frustrates me to no end, my compensation is directly hinged on the amount of death benefit that you buy. Okay? So what I could have done was I could have gone into the computer and said, computer, $25,000 premium, you go ahead and tell me the death benefit, and I want to generate some income, right? Now it spits out a million-dollar death benefit. My compensation just went up, okay? And your policy is going to perform worse than this policy. Does that make sense? Because your internal costs are higher. You're paying for something that you didn't necessarily need. You're paying for a million dollar policy instead of a $500,000 policy, which means your internal costs are higher, which means the policy doesn't perform as well. Does that make sense? Okay, so I, I tend to go the opposite direction and I tell the computer a different story. I want you to do the lowest death benefit possible. Now, by rounding it off by $15,000, is not going to significantly impact this policy, okay? And it might even give me a discount on on cost per thousand, there's all sorts of mechanics involved here. I share that with you because let's pretend for a moment that I'm working with Don and Don's situation calls for $1.5 million worth of life insurance. She has a physical need for $1.5 million of death benefit, okay? However, we're trying to fund for her retirement growth and protect her family, and we also want to handle that long-term care issue. Okay, what I might do is I might, and I'm going to make up something completely random here, but it'll illustrate my point. Let's pretend your budget was $27,000. I put $25,000 into this model and I get $500,000 of death benefit. I'm still a short by a million bucks, right? So then I would take some of that other premium and I would buy a universal life policy for a million, and I'm making up numbers. For a million with a long-term care writer right so what I just did was I maximized your insurance if you die tomorrow in this example someone's getting 1.5 million dollars of death benefit which was your initial goal done accomplished I fixed that however I've also given you a policy that's going to create income over here and a policy that's going to create a long-term care benefit over here two different goals designed two different ways okay and I stayed within the budget that I was allowed to stay in and I accomplish the ultimate goal. Does that make sense? Okay, so it all comes down to design. 
Because if I went and I made this into a $1.5 million policy and I threw $27,000 in premium and I put a long-term care rider on it, the income that you're going to get during retirement goes down. Why? Because it's a higher death benefit and I've got a rider on there that I'm paying for to cover you for long-term care. So it all, it all pans out. And I always use myself in this example because I've got index policies. I even have some old whole life policies. And I've got some term insurance. Okay, why do I have three different kinds of policies? Well, because I have a need to cover all of my things that, I, that are important to me and my family. I have a need for about $5 million worth of death benefit. If I died tomorrow, my wife gets a check for five million bucks. She will not ask were these term dollars or permanent dollars. She doesn't care. At that point, what she cares about is, is where's the check and when do I get it, right? But when I retire or I wind up in a long-term care setting, I guarantee you the question is, were these term dollars or permanent dollars? Because the term doesn't get me anything. The permanent gets me either an income stream or a long-term care benefit, you see? So I can stack policies and accomplish different goals by creating a custom design insurance portfolio. So that, does that make all sense now? Okay. So that's how index life works in a nutshell. I mean, I could, I could drill down deeper and deeper. I think you get the, the gist of it. You understand the mechanics and the moving pieces and you can see that a premium of, for example, 25,000 can generate a very substantial income, $52,000 a year tax-free. Now, what you need to know because this is a question that you might want to ask is, do I have to take $52,000 when I turn 71? No, you can take it before that. You can take it at 59 and a half. There won't be as much there because it didn't have as much time to grow. Okay. The reason it shows like this is I have to tell the computer something. The computer can't randomly generate without me putting some input in. And the input that I have to put in is, what's the premium? When do you want to turn on income? And when do you want to turn off income? If you said, gosh, I won't need $52,000 a year at 90. Uh, what if I only took income for 10 years? Well, your income goes up substantially because I just shaved off the last 10 years of income and I pushed it all up to the top. So you're going to take out more income. So my point is you have flexibility. You have ability to do what you want to do without any rules from the IRS. You also have liquidity. Let me go back up here. Um, here it is, policy year one. Let's pretend, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use you in this example, Don. Let's pretend that year 10, you're 65 years old, you have just about $300,000 in cash value in your policy. And a financial opportunity comes up. I don't know what it is. Let's just make up something. Okay, and you need, a, you need to take some money out. You need $50,000. You call the insurance company, or you call me. Lane, I need to take a loan of $50,000. They cut you a check and they mail you a check for $50,000. It's that fast. It's seriously that fast. There may or may not be a form if the loan amount is really high. Okay. They literally will cut you a check and mail it to you. There's no other requirements or anything like that. Okay. At Does that make point, sense? At this point, I've put $25,000 in a year for 10 years. Okay. Right. Is that right? I, I basically put in $250,000 and my cash back, my account's worth three hundred. dollars Exactly. And my death benefit is seven ninety six. Exactly. And I this have, yeah, my net cash value is the same. Yes, your cash value is um, yeah, it's it's almost the same. You're, you still have a small surrender charge in there. That's why there's a difference between the two. So if you were to cash out, let's pretend at age sixty five, you said, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to leave insurance to anybody. I don't want the tax free income. I just want to take my money and do X. Well, you surrender the policy, you're getting back in this example, $290,881. You put in 250 and you get back 290. Now, let me give you the answer to the next question. Do I have to pay taxes on $290,000? The answer is no, you don't. However, you do have to pay taxes on the gain. So you put in 250, you took out 290, right? So there's a $40,000 in rounding. There's a $40,000 gain, right? That $40,000 is taxed to you as ordinary income because you surrendered the policy. If you never surrender the policy, you never pay that tax. So going to my example, let's pretend you did exactly what's illustrated here. You put in 300,000, you pulled out 741,000 tax-free, 
you never surrendered the policy. And at age 90, you die. Let's call it 91. There's a line break there. So you die at age 91. Someone gets $454,000. No tax. There's no income tax, no ordinary, nothing. All taxes are paid. Done. Nothing's owed to anybody. And the $25,000 that was um, put in each year, that was after tax money. Correct. Okay. Life insurance is non-deductible. You cannot yep. deduct it. Okay. Okay. So that's all there's to it, guys. There's, I mean, it's it's literally that simple. It's that straightforward. So what's the catch, and why isn't everybody doing this? Great question. I would tell you the there's there's really no catch. I mean, you saw the surrender charge. That's that's the catch. If you do it and you get out, you lose some money. So I would advise you don't do it if you're not going to do it long term uh, or scale it to what you can afford to do and that you will stick with the why isn't everybody doing it? I would tell you the biggest reason is lack of knowledge. You don't know what you don't know. Uh, bad reputation. Bad advisors doing it incorrectly. Okay. There are schools of thought out there where you're dealing with the Dave Ramsey types. And I don't mean that in a negative light. I mean that in an uneducated light. Okay. Because you get guys with a microphone and they tell you on a broad based basis, don't do permanent insurance. Well, the problem is you don't understand the permanent insurance and the people you're sending them to don't either. So they're giving bad advice, they're doing poor design work. That's why. It's that simple. So, you know, if you look at the people who have high net worth, the people who understand and take the time, Every one of them has permanent life insurance. Guarantee it. I guarantee it. You go to anybody with real wealth, they all have permanent life insurance. But they're also not following Dave Ramsey. Okay. You know, think about this for a second. And I don't mean to beat up on Dave Ramsey or Susie Orman or any of those folks. I just want to point something out. Okay. Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman and those people in that arena are chasing a certain type of client. Okay. They're talking about get yourself out of debt, start building wealth. These are not people like you. These are not people who are struggling day to day. I'm sorry. These are people that are struggling day to day just to get their arms around the concept of money. Okay. And I will agree with both Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman. Those people should not be in permanent insurance. This is not a solution for someone living check to check. This is a solution for someone with some money. This is a solution for people that have bigger intentions and bigger goals. The people that they're targeting need life insurance, but they need term insurance, flat and simple. I will agree with them on that. However, once they excel past that place in life where they've accomplished what they've set out to do under the Dave Ramsey and the Susie Orman model, and they've started to accumulate real wealth, these become very strong, sound strategies. However, by the time they hit that under that model, They've had it burned into their brain that this is a horrible plan. And what they wind up doing is investing in mutual funds, stocks, bonds, and stuff that has risk. And they don't know what the risk is. And, and they're doing things that, because you hear guys like Dave Ramsey saying, you should be able to get 12% on your mutual funds. Dave Ramsey, you should lose every license you have. Well, by the way, you don't have a license. You should not be allowed to give that advice because 12% is obscene. Anytime he says 12%, he should be fine. That is ridiculous to say that. The same as, you see where I'm going with this? No, I don't mean to go down the, that path. I just want you to understand that the, the, the aura around permanent life insurance has been given a bad name, and partially because the guys in the industry are doing it wrong, plain and simple. You know, I, I, I've got, uh, oh, there was a guy, he, he I remember let me, who he just, was. let me just ask you, so the, the plan that you're talking about, the plan that you just presented to us is the one that Renee and Fred put in place a couple years ago, yeah. Not a couple. That's right. It's been longer than that now. Six, five, six. Before, yeah, we're going on six was born, years. Before yeah, it was, was born, or this is before Penelope. Yeah, I think so. So six yeah. years. So this, what you're talking about, is what they bought into hook, line, and sinker. Yes. Yeah. This is exactly what they have, just different numbers. Their numbers are all. The only thing that's different, the concept is identical. The design is identical. Okay. And it's what I'm doing. <laughs> okay. I wouldn't tell you to do it if I wasn't doing it myself. 
I, in fact, I even have this particular company that I'm doing it with. This illustration that you see is the company I'm using for my personal one. Okay. Okay. And, and it goes back to what I was talking about earlier. If you've got, you know, somebody else you want to use, I'm fine with that. Please, please, please just tell them you want the illustration. You can bounce it off of me. I had a guy that came to me with an illustration and I told him exactly, I said, I want you to go back to this advisor, tell him this is not right. Here's what you want done. And the guy came back with another illustration that was done wrong. So I did the illustration for him and I said, here, hand this illustration to this guy and tell him this is what you want. And if he's not willing to do it, you're not going to do the business. <laughs> I did the illustration for the advisor. This is how it's to be done. Why do you keep coming back with this other garbage? It's not right. Do it this way or you're not going to do the business with him. <laughs> I finally gave up. <laughs> he did the business with me because the guy couldn't get it figured out. Like, this is not complicated, guys. This is how you ask the computer to do it. And if you do it right, you make a lot of money. You know, but I can beat that guy in competition all day because your goal is not death benefit, it's income. My income was 10% higher than his at any given shot because he couldn't do the illustration right. All right, so let's say we want to put more away. Okay. What if we want that 25 to be 50? Um, okay, so here's, this is where I have to bring it down. Okay, and what I mean by that is, this is, in this example, the maximum premium you can put into this policy at any given year. If you said, I want to do 50, I could run it at 50. I could even say, okay, if you did 50 in the first year, 25 in the next, then 50, we could do varying premiums because it is a variable premium product. So you have that flexibility. What I don't want to do is if you said to me, Lane, I want to do 50,000 this year and then 10,000 each year after that. Then you get a huge discrepancy, right? In order to maintain all those tax advantages, I have to make the death benefit work. Well, if you dump in a huge amount in your first year, that death benefit goes up. So in your there's policy sweet spots. There's, there's sweet spots. There's sweet spots. Absolutely. Okay. And that's an individual thing, Don, where you say, hey, I can do this every year for this many years. I feel good about it. Then I will design it that way, and then we can drop it down after that. Aaron, do you have any questions? I know you're on the move, and looks like yes. you're ready to need to leave. Do you have any specific questions for Lane or do you? You're on mute, honey. You're on mute here. Yep. Bottom left hand. Left hand. Um, yeah. I don't have any specific. I mean, it sounds great. I'm in. Sign me up. Um, um, how does the trust, how does the, how does the um, trust factor into any of this? Okay. So, you don't need the trust before you do the insurance. However, if you do get a trust in advance, then we apply for the policy in the name of the trust as the trust is the owner and the trust is the beneficiary. You're the trustee. Is that advisable, Lane? Is it advisable to do that? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So you're, you're saving a step. Yeah. I mean, it, it, the reality is, is if you were to do the life insurance and then two weeks from that, you got the trust in place, I just have another form that needs to be completed that changes the owner and the beneficiary to your trust. It's not a big deal. It's a sh simple two page form, no big deal. So the order you do it in means nothing. Okay. It, it, it really doesn't mean anything. However, you do want to have your trust own and be the beneficiary of your life insurance because the beneficiary, when, when you pass away, the trust then gets the money and the trust is going to distribute to your beneficiaries how you want it done. Because the life insurance company is going to write a check. They're not going to be in charge of making multiple distributions to your heirs. They're going to say, okay, uh, Don, you're the beneficiary of Aaron's policy. Aaron dies. Okay. You're getting a check. Excellent. <laughs> and done. <laughs> Close her up. Um, okay, so let me see if I can get this in a really quick recap. Don, you, you try and go along with me. All right. So I put $25,000 a year in tax-free. I mean, um, uh, post-tax, post-tax, post-tax. And in this example, um, after 12 years, it grows to $300,000. Uh, I mean, it doesn't grow to 300,000. I've put in $300,000. In this example, because of the zero to 13 indexed life insurance, you know, we're assuming a rate of 7% growth. It, grows to what's my number? Three ninety two hundred and sixty seven. What is it? Three hundred and ninety two thousand by age sixty seven in this example. Technically 
Cash that's your cash back. Three ninety two. So that's what it grew to, right? And at that point, I have a. If I died, I would have a death benefit of eight forty four. A death benefit of eight forty four. I could take out my money at at sixty seven. Is that what you said? I could. Yes. At three ninety two, and then it would be. Ta I would have to pay tax on the. Um, the amount about two fifty. Uh, the amount about three hundred. Right. Ordinary income tax on ninety two thousand dollars. Okay. And. Um, but then I could um, set up an income stream. Is there when 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 do you start up? When do you start that income stream? Is there a is there a um, any limitation? No, no limitation. You tell me when you want to turn it on, and mm -hmm. if you want to turn it up, turn it down, turn it on, turn it off. You can do that. Okay. So if, if let's pretend you already have a bunch of money saved in a retirement plan, what I might tell you to do, and, and there's a whole conversation about retirement planning and, and how to properly dispose of that wealth, but let's pretend for a moment that you've got money in that retirement plan. What I might tell you to do is use that money first, taking you from age 68 to age 71, and then turn this on at age 71, because you don't want to pass wealth on to your family in the form of qualified money. 401ks, IRAs is the worst way to transfer wealth to your heirs. And there's a whole conversation that surrounds that. So I would say use that money first and then turn this on. Okay. You might say taxes are really high. Okay, well, let's turn on the 401k a little bit and turn this on a little bit and get a little bit from both plans. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is, this is, um, like you would, this is in place of retirement plans. This becomes your retirement plan, yes. You're just, you're just um, talking about the other ones that they're already in place. Agreed. Like okay. me, I, I did away with all of my qualified retirement plans just because it's, it was, to me, it was a waste of money. I didn't see the value in it anymore because knowing what I know. Meaning you cashed them out? I have moved all of them to Roth IRAs. Uh-huh. I did that before my income was too high and I couldn't do it. I just, everything is in a Roth IRA or life insurance. Those are the two places I've got. I have, my retirement plan. I, have, I have to go. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much, Lee. All right. Talk to you guys later. Thanks, Lane. We'll be in touch. I'm sure, Thanks, my, I'm sure my sisters will fill me in more. That's totally fine. Do you have questions? Call I'll me. do whatever they do. <laughs> well, let's do it step by step together. Every step. Okay. Whatever you need. Follows along. Robin, you too, if you want. Don. Aaron, I think this is, I mean, just quick, quickly, because of our situation, because we are, we've ended up, I think this is actually such a good, you know, because we're so limited with what we've been able to contribute to, to 401ks, this is, I mean, I wish we'd have done it 10 years ago. And I think, I don't, I, I'm pretty sure it's a no brainer. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. You just took the key. Right. All I need to know from you in order to design a plan is the state you live in, your date of birth, and they have a quick conversation about your health so I can run the illustration correctly and how much you want to contribute. Those are really the four pieces of data that I need, and then I can back into the illustration from there. Because I do have to run it state specific, and I do need to know your health and if you use any nicotine. And, all right, uh, I gotta go, I'm sorry, Lane. That's all right, see you. Thank you. So with that data, then I can back into the illustration. Okay, so I know we were on this recorded line and you don't wanna maybe share